What's up guys? Welcome back to Tidal Gardens. This video is all about the cooling system that we've just had installed here. So cooling is probably one of the most difficult things to do at scale. For a home hobbyist system, it's pretty trivial to just go out and buy a chiller, right? It's basically like an air conditioning unit for your tank. But once you start to get into like the thousands of gallons, once you start talking about having a greenhouse system where you're getting a lot of thermal overload just from like the sun, it becomes a lot more challenging. So some people do ask me, how do you manage temperatures? And in the greenhouse, we have to do all kinds of stuff. We have to run fans, we have rooftop vents, and we were running a geothermal cooling system of sorts using water. People would also ask me then, do you have a chiller for the greenhouse? And basically, that's not something that's even possible because for a chiller to manage that volume of water that gets to that temperature, it would require a chilling unit almost the size of the entire greenhouse. And I definitely don't have the electrical capacity to ever plug something like that in. We have to kind of come up with more creative solutions to, to manage temperature, right? So once this building got built, one of the things that I had always kind of envisioned was to use the rainwater collection cisterns as a closed loop geothermal source to cool down our tanks. Let's take a minute and do a walkthrough of the cistern in general. So first up, this entire building collects rainwater and it goes through a vortex filter and that kind of sifts out any kind of debris from like branches or leaves or pollen or anything like that before it gets into the underground cisterns. There are a total of two 5,000 gallon concrete cisterns <laughs> underground and so a total of 10,000 gallons that we can collect. Now what we've done is mainly use that water for the RO system. So instead of using our well, which has TDS of around 1,000, we're uh, running TDS of 100 rainwater through our RO system. So it's a lot more efficient, it's a lot cleaner, and honestly, it kind of saves the well. Because there's a couple of houses around here that have some difficulty with their well supply. We haven't had that problem, but I don't want to risk it either. So we have this uh, rainwater collection system mainly to, um, to provide that RO source. Now, since we have like 10,000 gallons sitting underground, that remains at a consistent 55 degrees Fahrenheit pretty much all year round. That's a great uh, heat exchange source that we can basically dump all the heat from our tanks down into. And the ground cooling will just soak it up over time. Um, we haven't done the exact, the exact BTU calculations, but it's immense. I mean, 10,000 gallons of underground water, it's a lot of cooling capacity. What is sitting in the cistern currently is a heat exchange coil. I believe it's around 1,000 feet. And we can expand that over time if need be, but when we did the calculations, this is pretty much kind of that sweet spot. It's a thousand feet of um, PEX coils in there. And on demand, we have a system that will monitor the temperature of all the different aquariums and run heat exchange coils for just that system when necessary. So let's take a look at that. All right, guys, in this upstairs area, we have a kind of like a utility closet of sorts. And here we have housed our uh, air conditioning unit, as well as this brand new cooling system. This thing is possibly my new favorite thing in this whole building. I mean, the tanks and stuff are nice, but I love stuff like this. So we have a similar system for heating, kind of similar, um, and we've done some videos on that in the past, but this is a completely independent cooling system. So I guess let's start from the very top and kind of like work our way down. So first off, we have a bunch of zone controls as well as temperature sensors. 
So we have a total of nine different systems planned for this whole building and next door at the greenhouse. So for example, we've got the four systems here for this building, as well as the five systems that are in the greenhouse. So these are actually all operational. So we can see here that the first set is 77, second set is 78, 78, 78, 78. This system is designed to come on once the temperatures hit 79 degrees. So if one of these guys triggers the system, it'll send a, a signal up to the, the zone control relays up top here. Now we've got two banks of relays, one for this building and one for the greenhouse. And within these, there are a total of six zones. And we decided to go with that, even though there's only four zones that actually need any kind of, uh, any t any kind of cooling, and there's only five here, where there's always extra relays just in case one fries itself. It's pretty trivial to pop this thing open and rewire it to another relay. So this one essentially has two backup relays. This one over here has one backup relay. It's much easier than swapping out the entire thing, right? So that's kind of how this works. Once a temperature call is made, what will then happen is this guy, let's say, uh, let's say this system right here uh, is demanding some kind of cooling. It will signal to a zone control valve to open up. And that is what, what these guys here are. So in the previous heating system, the, the design of it was every single zone had its own pump. This system here has a single pump and a bunch of zone controls. There's a couple of advantages to that, but the, I would say that the biggest advantage to doing it this way for a cooling system is you don't have the heat of possibly nine separate pumps contributing to heating up the water in the coils. It's minor, but at the same time, if the point of the system is to cool down, it kind of defeats the purpose to also be introducing additional heat when it's really not necessary. So these zone control valves, they don't really contribute any heat to it, and you're really running off of a single variable speed drive pump, which, by the way, I've never seen anything like this. It is so flippin' cool. I mean, it's got a screen on the pump that like tells you like your PSI and, and head pressure and like everything that's going on with this with this variable speed pump. Totally insane. It's like I said, I'm kind of geeking out over this. It's one of my favorite things, this whole uh, this whole system here. And what's kind of cool is you can see uh, the temperature of the incoming water as well as the, the water that's going back into the cistern. So you can see that delta T. Delta T is like the, the difference in the incoming and outgoing water. So you see how much cooling is actually happening. One thing that I'd like to point out is that it's really nice to have multiple sets of temperature gauges because one thing that we found was kind of difficult was finding, I guess, reliable uh, just temperature monitoring. So right now, for every single system, we have three. On the cooling system, we see all the different temperatures. But mirrored on this is the, the heating system that also has its own temperature probes. And in addition, we have aquarium temperature controllers that also have a temperature probe. So we have three different sources that are giving us temperature information because we found that like a lot of these things are really difficult to, to figure out who's telling the truth, for lack of a better word, because even like the little um, infrared guns were giving us different readings, different temperature probes were giving us different readings. So it's nice to at least stay consistent based on the reading of three different probes. One cool maintenance aspect of these zone controls is that they are not actually plumbed in to these lines. So if they ever needed to be replaced and repaired, there's a little trigger up top here and this entire assembly can just come right off. So you close the valve, hit this button here, the whole thing just comes right out and you can slap a new one right in. The wiring is pretty simple. So you guys might be wondering just how we even got the lines over to the greenhouse. So this is the outside of that utility closet here. So you can see all the different lines go out of that room, 
This goes straight down and tucked in behind all of that filtration for the RO system. There's some sleeves that can route lines out of this building underground and into the greenhouse. So that's where all that magic is happening. All right, so we're back here looking at the heating system. You might be wondering, fan, you have a separate cooling system and a separate heating system. How do you prevent both of them to try to both cool and heat at the same time, essentially fighting each other? Because let's say uh, one of these temperature probes is calling for heat. And then at the same time, a, a cooling temperature probe is saying, hey, it's getting a little warm. Let's crank down the temperature here. And you just essentially have both systems fighting each other 24 seven. So there's two things that we did to try to eliminate that kind of friction. So the first thing is there is a one or two degree temperature separation between when the heating system comes on and when the cooling system comes on. So these guys here, I think, are uh, accurate to plus or minus one degree. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there. And so hopefully there is this one degree gap that prevents the systems from fighting each other. So that's one thing, right? That's kind of like the, the brute force method. So there, there really should be a, a pretty tight temperature range and they really shouldn't both come on for the same zone at the same time. Great. There is another system, however, that's more relay based. So essentially what will happen is if this system here is calling for heat, what that will do is send a message over to the cooling system that it cannot turn on until this guy is done doing its job. So for example, this guy, let's say it's reading, it's oh, 76 and we really would like it at 77. This guy starts cranking up heat. Even if the cooling system over there says, hey, it's actually a little bit warm for some reason. It thinks that it's 79 and needs to come down. Don't know why, right? Well, what will happen is this system here will essentially shut off the cooling system on that particular zone until this is done raising it from 76 to 77. At that point, if that, that system over there still thinks that it needs to be cooled, then it will kick on and bring the temperature back down. So it's not exactly fighting each other at the same time, but they will kind of go back and forth. It's some degree of separation, I guess, but ideally there's gonna be this temperature gap in between, so they really shouldn't fight so much. But like I said, just in case, there is a relay backup that's gonna prevent the two from just being on at the same time and just cranking through both natural gas and electric. When you compare the electrical consumption of what a chiller would demand for the types of volumes that we're looking at, because I think when we're fully, fully operational with everything going on downstairs, it's going to be something on the order of like 15,000 gallons total. To cool that with a chiller system, I mean, that might be thousands of dollars per month in electric, right? Versus a fairly low power consumption pump. And these zone control valves are all very low energy consumption as well. This system long term will pay dividends just in, in energy savings, but it also, I like how it fully utilizes the infrastructure that we've already built here. One minor benefit also of transferring the heat from the, the greenhouse tanks and from these warehouse tanks into the underground cistern is that even if it's able to raise the, the temperature of the water in that cistern just a little bit, that strangely will increase the efficiency of our RO system. So it's kind of like doing double duty. It's helping control the, the tank temperature as well as essentially making more RO per gallon. It's kind of neat. One really cool thing about the underground cistern is that it's scalable. Because really, like as you saw downstairs, all the build out is already done. All the really expensive stuff, all the really resource intensive stuff is in place here. To add a couple of additional storage tanks in the ground, it's pretty much not a big deal because you're, all you're doing, digging a big hole, putting in a couple of concrete cisterns, plumbing it in with some six inch PVC, I think. It's super easy compared to 
all the other stuff that we've built in based off of that system. In theory, if ever we wanted to expand from our 10,000 gallons currently to 50,000 gallons, all it is is just holes in the ground, concrete cisterns. And essentially at that point, we are completely drought resistant and also have that much more cooling capacity if we ever needed it. All right guys, that pretty much does it for this really short video on our cooling systems. I hope you learned something. I certainly did when it was all going in. This is one of those things where a good plumber is worth their weight in gold because I can plumb a little bit, but it's pretty clear that never in a million years would I be able to personally plumb anything remotely close to what we got here. So big shout out to my genius plumbers. And if you have any questions, please throw them into the comments below. I'm sure that there's a lot to talk about. It's a really cool system, like I said. So anyways, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all next time. Take care. Happy reefing.